الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيد الأنبياء والمرسلين وعلى آله وصحبه ومن استنى بسنته إلى يوم الدين اللهم اجعلنا منهم ومن الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر أمين يا رب العالمين ثم أما بعد فأعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم ما كان محمد أبا أحد من رجالكم ولكن رسول الله وخاتم النبيين رب الشحل صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي أمين يا رب العالمين uh, a concept that I wanted to bring to everyone's attention, you know, sometimes I like talking about ayat of the Qur'an in a vacuum, and sometimes I like to talk about the ayat of the Qur'an in the context of the time and the age in which we live. Uh, one of the problems that I've seen occur um, as of late, and I think it's been around for a long time, but I, I've just seen more and more of it, and I've seen emails about it, and I get contacted about it, is um, this idea that, you know, we should really take the Qur'an very seriously, uh, but the Prophet Sallallahu the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu is secondary, or it's uh, you know it's questionable. We're not sure if Hadith is as protected as the Quran is, and you know, and the entire corpus of the Sunnah, the, the legacy of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Even from a philosophical perspective, different kinds of criticisms are made. One kind of criticism made is it's not as preserved as the Quran is. It's not as well preserved. Another kind of criticism made is well, even if it is preserved. Uh, well, really, what makes him, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, the messenger, is the fact that he delivered the message, and the message is the Quran. So, really, we should keep the eyes on the prize. The primary is the Quran, and we should not get distracted by that. The Sunnah is there, but it doesn't it doesn't apply the way the Quran does. Some people have gone even as far as to say that taking the Sunnah, um, you know, uh, as a as a divine source of guidance is tantamount to shirk because you're taking the actions of a human being and you're equating them with the action or the words of Allah, right? So these kinds of arguments are floating around. They're made online. They're, they're people that purport them, etc. And I was exposed to a lot of this criticism or this kind of weird thinking later. Uh, but I did, I will tell you for myself personally, I became a student of the Quran, I keep saying almost 15 years ago. And I just, I was fascinated with this book. And one of the first lessons that I could not escape was how the best defense, the most powerful defense of the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ is actually the Qur'an. There is no better defense of the legacy of the sunnah than the Book of Allah itself. In other words, there's no way somebody can actually say that they believe in the Qur'an and they don't believe in the sunnah. The only way they can really say that is if they don't study the Qur'an. I think my mic got cut off, but the, I'll say it again. The only way you can really say that is if you don't study the Qur'an itself. Or if you don't take each of its words seriously. So I wanted to give you an example of that. Uh, just of that. Of um, how the Qur'an protects the integrity of the sunnah of the Prophet wasallam, And how it is actually... It's really the way to view the sunnah is that it's actually the, the Qur'an brought to life. That's what it is. It's the Qur'an from the words brought into the life of a human being. Because the Sunnah is not just the words of the Prophet ﷺ, it's actually his actions as well. One really exciting project that um, hopefully it comes to fruition, I talked to Sheikh Abu Bakr from Australia about that. It's a, just a phenomenal project that he's working on, inshallah it's a Bayina project soon, uh, is that he wants to go through the entire corpus of Sunnah and tie every hadith to an ayah of the Qur'an. Just to illustrate how these two things are inseparable. They're just inseparable. But anyway, today's uh, discussion, I wanted to make it about uh, legislation. Because one of those philosophical arguments is, Allah has the right to give laws. But the Prophet ﷺ is just Allah's slave. He has no right to decide laws or judge. It. Law can only come from Allah. And therefore, the sunnah is secondary. Quran is primary. That sounds like a powerful argument at face value, even if as you hear it, you're disturbed by it, I'm sure. But it sounds like a pretty rational, powerful argument. I want to just explore one place in the Quran where Allah responds to the subject. This happens in Surah An-Nisa. And Allah Azza wa says, Bala, on the contrary, Warabbika, I swear by your master. Now these ayat, these are, I believe, ayat 66 and 67. Let me open them up in my Mus'haf too. Um, ayat 66 and 67 and they are intricately tied to each other um, in one ayah, in the first of these two ayat uh, 
Hold on a second. Let me find the ayah number exactly. Yeah, no. Fala wa rabbika is 65 and then the next one is 66. Those two ayat, 65 and 66. Okay. So here, one of the rare occasions in the Quran in ayah number 65 of Surah An-Nisa where Allah decides to swear by himself. Allah swears by time. Allah swears by the sky. Allah swears by, you know, the, you know, uh, the, the sun, wa shamsi wa duhaha. Allah swears by the morning, right? But the, by the placement of the stars, فَلَا أُقْسِمُ بِمَوَاقِعِ nujum, And those are some magnificent creations of Allah, but this place is one of the more unique places in the Qur'an where Allah decides to make this point. None of those creations are magnificent enough to give you an idea of the value, the power of what is being said. So he says, وَرَبِّكَ I swear by your Rabb. But I, I, before I go on, one just quick precursor about the, the purpose of taking an oath. Like he says, I swear by your Rabb. What is the purpose for which an oath is taken, especially in the Quran? There are several reasons. I've talked about them in several lectures. I'll be very quick today about this. Uh, the, the first reason is that you're angry. Uh, you stop. Stop it. Stop. I swear you better stop it. So when you say, I swear, it can be an expression of what? Anger. Another purpose of the oath uh, to swear is actually to get your attention, which is common in Arabic culture. It's not so much in other cultures, but in Arabic culture, in old Arabic culture, when you swore, you're trying to get people's attention. Okay? So when you swear, like, and you usually swear by something that will get people's attention. So they'll say, wa sabah, I swear by next morning. So everybody's thinking, oh my God, something bad is happening tomorrow morning. I better go listen. They try to get the attention. You know, the way we do try to get attention is, excuse me, please, could you please listen? There's an important announcement. Please, please, kindly, you know. But their way of getting attention was just to call it out, take an oath. Okay. Another easy way to think about an oath is when you take an oath when you're not being believed. Why are you late? Oh, it's a lot of traffic. Mm-hmm, traffic. I swear, I swear to Allah it was traffic. So you swear because you're not being believed. Somebody listening to you is not sure about the truth of what you're saying. But then the Qur'an adds another dimension. All of these are true, but the Qur'an adds another dimension to the oaths that doesn't exist elsewhere. And the Qur'an adds the dimension that it actually, it takes two parts. It takes the thing you're swearing by and the subject. Right, for example, Allah swears by time. That's the thing that he swore by, time. And then the subject was that human beings are in loss, right? So there's the object, the thing, and the subject. What Allah does in the Quran is He takes the object, the thing that you're swearing by, and He makes it a proof of the subject. So for example, وَالْعَصْرِ إِنَّ الْإِنسَانَ لَفِي خُسْرِ I swear by time, human, human beings are in loss. What's the biggest proof that human beings are in loss? They're running out of time. You can gain a lot of money, you can't gain time. You can gain strength, you can't gain time. You can never own it either. You can own property, you can own things, you can own clothes, you can own money. You can't own even one minute. You can't own it. It's not up to you. So the ultimate proof of the loss of a human being is what? Time. So the, the thing he swears by becomes proof of what's coming. So coming to this ayah, it is as though nothing in existence is strong enough proof for what he's about to say that the only thing that can truly prove what he's about to say is himself. He uses himself as proof for what he's about to say. When he says, Fala, then no, wa rabbika, I swear by your Rabb. By the way, the ka in rabbika, your master, the ka from anta, you did that today, right? goes back to the Messenger wasallam. So actually this oath is a direct conversation with who? The Messenger of Allah wasallam. We're indirect audience. The direct audience of this ayah is the Messenger of Allah wasallam. Fala wa rabbika. Okay. Now the Messenger is about to be told something that is so powerful and the evidence of it and the witness of it is Allah Himself. Allah Himself testifies to what He's about to say. What is it that He's going to say? First thing He says is, لا يؤمنون They don't believe. The big truth that He was going to give to the Prophet ﷺ is what? They don't believe. Wow. Uh, I don't want to be part of them. 
If Allah in the Quran somewhere said they don't believe, that's bad enough. When he swears by himself, goes out of his way, not even to swear by something else, by himself, making himself the ultimate witness and proof, and then says they don't believe, he must be talking about a group of people who have no shred of iman whatsoever, as far as he's concerned. Like this is the strongest statement of saying someone doesn't have iman, I would argue in the entire Quran. There's no stronger way of saying somebody doesn't have iman. By the time you read this much, and I read this much, we're supposed to get really worried. Because he doesn't say who they are. He just says they don't believe. I don't know who they are. I better find out. Because these are people in some serious, serious trouble. He says, Hatta yuhakkimuka. Until, they don't believe, until they make you the judge. They make you the judge. They make you the hakim. Hakkama, to make someone a hakim. To make someone the decision maker. Hukum also doesn't just mean, hukum is different from qada. Qada actually means a verdict. Like a qadi is a judge, and he does qada, so he does a verdict. Hukum is actually a, a verdict and a judgment made with wisdom. Because hukum shares the same root with what word? Hikmah. So when you do hukum, you're actually passing a verdict that is full of what? Wisdom. Okay. Until they make you, I'll put it in that sense then, until they make you, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the wise decision maker. Because in, in the word you hakimuka, the messenger alayhi salatu wa sallam has already been declared full of wisdom. Not only the decision maker, but also full of wisdom. Now, I told you somebody argues that the decisions should be made not by the messenger, they should be made by Allah. They should be made by the Qur'an. And the Qur'an should be the final decider. The Qur'an is saying not they don't have any iman until they make the Qur'an the decision maker. They don't have any iman until they take the revelation and make it the decision maker. Allah is saying they have no shred of iman and he swears by himself until they make you, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, you, the decision maker. How personal is that? He tells him directly, until you are taken as the judge of everything that they do, they have no shred of iman. I want you to, before we go on with this ayah, I want you to think about this, this very important concept. To us, the Quran is a book. And then the sunnah is a bunch of books. You know, when people think of sunnah, they think of, for example, books of hadith, among other things. Bukhari, Muslim, you know, Tirmidhi, etc, 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 yeah? So this is Qur'an and this is what? Sunnah. Two, two separate departments in the library. Qur'an, Sunnah. Now think about the Sahaba. Abu Bakr is sitting there. When he thinks of Qur'an, what does he think of? He doesn't think of a book. There is no book there. Whose voice plays in his head when he thinks of Qur'an? The Prophet of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And when he thinks of sunnah, what does he think of? For the sahabi, the Qur'an and the sunnah come out of the same mouth. The Qur'an and the sunnah are the same person to him. You see, Al-Qur'an yamshi, like the sahabiya describes, the mother of the believer describes, Qur'an walking around. Kana khuluquhu al-Qur'an, his character was Qur'an itself. If you want to see Qur'an come to life, you see the Prophet Wasallam. To him, to, uh, to them, they were not two different sections of a library. They were one person, completely inseparable. Now to us, we think of this as one source and that as another source. We separated those two things. So he says, حَتَّى يُحَكِّمُوكَ Until they make you the decision maker. فِيمَا شَجَرَ بَيْنَهُمْ What incredible language. He says, until they make you the decision maker in whatever, whatever sprouts between them. Shajara, you know what the word shajara means, right? It's tree. Shajara as a verb means something that comes out of the ground. Now the thing is, there are things that are still in the ground and there are things that will later on come out of the ground, yes? In this ayah, Allah is saying that whatever has already come out of the ground, whatever issues have already been raised, and whatever issues will be raised in the future. In all of them, who should be the one deciding? The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa The Qur'an becomes inseparable from the sunnah. There are not two separate sources of le le legislation, they are actually one and the same.
they're one and the same. It's actually the Quran is not to be understood without the Messenger. How can you? But that's not enough. Allah says in this ayah, even that is not enough. Even if somebody comes and says, okay, fine, I will let the sunnah decide how I should be or what the decision should be. Even that's not enough. He says after that, ثُمَّ لَا يَجِدُوا فِي أَنفُسِهِمْ حَرَجًا مِمَّا قَضَيْتَ Then they don't find inside of themselves, deep inside themselves, any tightness, any discomfort over whatever decision you made. مِمَّا قَضَيْتَ Now notice, instead of saying مِمَّا حَكَمْتَ because the word was يُحَكِّمُوكَ the, the word was حُكُمْ Now there's a switch. He says مِمَّا قَضَيْتَ from whatever verdict you pass. Now the word with qada I told you is any judgment. What's, the, what's uh, hikmah or hukum? A judgment made with, you know why that's important? Because now Allah is saying whether the people see wisdom in what you do or not. Whether they see wisdom or not. Whatever verdict you make, whatever qada you pass, they better not find any discomfort deep inside of themselves over your verdict. Mimma qadaita. And by the way, it's, you know, the Arabic language is remarkable. There are advanced grammar things that I won't get to in this class. Something called a aid. You would say in Arabic, Mimma qadaitahu al aid. Al damir yaudu ila al nausul. Mimma qadaitahu. Whatever you decided, in particular, he says Mimma qadaita, as if to say the decisions you have to make are open-ended. They're not li limited to one issue. Virtually on any subject, when you make a decision, it's done. If the ayah was mimma qadaitahu, there would have been a restriction. The ayah is mimma qadaita. There's no, no pronoun added at the end. It opens it up even more. Subhanallah. In whatever decision you make, sallallahu alayhi wasallam, that's it. And then after that, finally, finally, this is the last part of this ayah. The last part of this ayah is about submission. What's the Arabic word for submission? Good. The Arabic word for submission is Islam. But you know, Islam in Arabic is a, an alternative for the word Islam is Taslim. Islam, another alternative is Taslim. And Taslim is different in two ways. Taslim is different in that Taslim is more powerful. The word Taslim is more powerful. So it's not just submission, it's unusual like form of submission. And Taslim is also continuous. Islam is one time, Taslim is continuous. The ayah is saying, after you've made the decision, what you salimu taslima, and they would completely and continuously give themselves in submission. And you salimu would have been enough, but Allah adds you salimu tasliman. This is another piece of Arabic grammar that's called maf'ul mutlaq, which means submission on top of submission on top of submission. There would be an absolute complete submission before what? Before what? When you think of submission, you always think of submission to Allah. Islam, we submit our will to the will of Allah. In this ayah, what is submission to? To the verdict passed by the Prophet ﷺ, whose wisdom you don't even see. If it was the wisdom you see it, then it would have been hukum, hakamta, it's qadaita. And it's not just a one-time submission, it is what? Continuous submission, and it is submission like no other submission. Oh my God. Oh my goodness. You have to put so much trust in the decision of Rasulullah Wasallam, and you're feeling uncomfortable with his decision. Allah swears you have no iman. May Allah not make us from them. Now the last thing. If you look at the next ayah, very quickly. Allah talks about trusting him. In order to understand this ayah, you should know something. Surah An-Nisa already told us, Allah intends to make your burden easy for you. Allah's, the goal of the laws of Islam is to make life easier, not harder. To lighten your burden. Now, with that in mind, imagine a crazy situation. Imagine you don't understand the wisdom in anything Allah says. Allah gives you a law and you're like, that doesn't make any sense. And so Allah gives you Himself some hypothetical situations. Had we made it law over them, had the law been on you and me, that you must kill your own selves. Suicide. Would that be a logical law? 
from the human logic, does suicide make sense? No. Awikhruju min diyarikum or leave your own homes. Even if you have a home, become homeless. These two things make absolutely no sense. On the one hand, you're sacrificing your life. On the other hand, you're sacrificing your home. It doesn't make any sense. Allah says, had it been the case, hypothetically, if that's what the law was, if that's what the law was, they wouldn't have done it. Very few, except very few among them. Most people would have said, this, this is crazy, this doesn't make any sense. What was the ending of the last ayah? Absolute and complete what? Submission. In the next ayah, he says, if I gave you things that didn't make sense to you, you wouldn't have done it. Very few of you would actually have submitted. مَا فَعَلُوهُ إِلَّا قَلِيلٌ مِّنْهُمْ وَلَوْ أَنَّهُمْ فَعَلُوا And had they done مَا يُعَظُونَ بِهِ Whatever they were being given advice to do لَكَانَ خَيْرَ اللَّهُمْ It would have absolutely would have been better for them. Even if Allah told you to die, it would have been better for you to die. If Allah told you to leave your home and be homeless, He would never tell you that unless it was what for you? It was better for you. That's the level of trust you have to have in Allah. لَكَانَ خَيْرَ اللَّهُمْ وَأَشَدَّ تَثْبِيتًا And it would have been more firm as a well thought out decision. Now the placement of this ayah is incredible. Because this ayah is about trusting Allah. But it comes right after you have to trust who? The Messenger's decision. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Allah put the trust in the Messenger before He put the trust in Himself. People like to say, I have a relationship with Allah. I don't need a relationship with the Messenger of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. You're thoroughly confused. You're deeply confused. Not, not if you study this book. This book is calling on a very strong relationship with the Messenger of Allah. I keep referring back to Hudaybiyah. I'll just tell you one thing about Hudaybiyah. One of the negotiators who came to meet with the Prophet Sallallahu on behalf of Quraysh, and he thought that he's going to come and scare them because nobody messes with Quraysh. So he walked in on the, the, the camp of the Muslims and the Muslims, some of them are from Aus, some of them are from Khazraj, some of them are exiles from Mecca, some of them were former slaves, some of them are Persian, some of them are Roman, they're all different people. So he was walking into a train station, all these different people. Everywhere else when you go in Arabia, you go into a tribe, you see those people of the same tribe, yes? And when you see an army, you see army of one tribe, then you see army of other tribe. When he walks into the Prophet ﷺ's company, he sees people of one tribe or different tribes? He sees people of different tribes. And so he walks up to him. And he says, Seriously? You're gonna fight Quraysh with these people? As soon as the fighting begins, they will run away from you. They'll run away. In his mind, he could not understand if you don't belong to the same tribe, how can you have loyalty? The people who are willing to die for you will be the people of your own tribe. The Quraysh are united, man. And you've got this train station with you? They're all going to run away. And you know, as he was talking, he heard one of the worst curses ever recorded in Islamic history. I can't even translate it. He, somebody in the crowd said some. And he said, who dare say that? And Abu Bakr came out. That was me. Abu Bakr, the nicest man. He got so angry, he cursed him. Anyway, long story short, the guy goes back. And now he's supposed to tell Quraysh what happened. So when he goes back, say, Quraysh says, what happened? He goes, you can't beat them. Why can't we beat them? What are you talking about? He goes, that man, when he spits, they fight each other to catch the spit. When he sweats, they fight each other to catch the drops. When he makes wudu and gargles, they drink the water. They are more, they are obsessed with him. I have never seen any, I've, I've been to kingdoms, I've been to courts of kings, I have seen the royal palaces, I have never seen people love and show a loyalty and respect to their leader like I've seen Muhammad and his followers, sallallahu alayhi wa I've never seen it. That's <laughs> the enemy who came to insult you walks away with like, I don't, I've never seen anything like this. I've never seen anything like it. This is the concept of how the Quran defends the integrity of the Prophet ﷺ. The last comment I want to make is actually trusting in the wisdom of the Sunnah of the Messenger ﷺ, is actually trusting Allah. <laughs> 
Allah. Allah said it explicitly. Whoever has obeyed the Messenger, all they've done is obey Allah. وَمَا يَنْتِقُوا عَنِ الْهَوَى He doesn't make stuff up. All the wisdom and all the practices and all the advice that he's giving you, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, is coming from who? It's coming from Allah. It's bringing the Quran to life by Allah's guidance. The 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 but the, the I know I said last thing, but one last thing. I promise. And that's this. There is a crime against the Sunnah, though. There's a crime against the Sunnah that I want to warn myself of, of and all of you of, and that is when you say something is Sunnah and it's not. Or when you say something is sunnah, but you don't really understand how and when that sunnah was established. So you draw your own conclusions about that sunnah, that hadith. The thing about a hadith is, for example, that the Prophet ﷺ said it at a certain place. He said it to a certain group of people. He said it to a certain family. And you know when you walk in on someone's conversation, and he's already talking to someone, He's not giving a lecture to everybody, he's talking to someone in particular, right? Could it be that he's dealing with a special situation? It could be, right? Now if you don't know that, you would think that he's giving a policy for what? Everyone. So you have to know background. You have to know context for the sunnah. You can't just read the translation of a hadith and say, I know what that means. I know how to apply it. Because that's also unfair to the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. It's unfair to not know how it was applied, how it was meant, you know? And so this is actually a big danger because people will make you feel guilty you're not following sunnah. You're not following what, what it, look, it says right here in Bukhari, right here. But when you ask the question, when was this said? Who was this said to? How was it understood? How was it acted on? What are the other subject matters on this, sub, this same hadith? How do you do it? You know, when I got into this subject, I, I you know, I, I noticed, I don't go on Facebook and Twitter or whatever, I'll just post something beneficial or something or my team will do it. I don't have time for social media personally. I, they do a good job, alhamdulillah. I think, I don't know, <laughs> you know. But so once in a while I will, they'll send me some things that people ask and people say, how come you never talk about hadith? I get a lot of that. Why do you only talk about Quran? You know why I do that? Because I love the sunnah so much that I'm scared to talk about it, something that I don't fully, fully grasp. When I have a question about a hadith, I, I literally fly. I, I'll take a flight to a muhadith and sit with them and ask them. Because I, I want to understand it properly. Because it's happened too, much, too many times in my own life, when I was learning about Islam, I learned about a hadith, and I sat in a halaqa, and somebody explained it to me, and I thought I knew what it meant, and later on I found out that was completely wrong. It was completely missing the entire context. And I got so scared that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hear the messenger's words and not be able to decipher. You know, Quran studies I've been doing for 15 years, I kind of know what to do. I know which tafsir to go to, which language sources to go to, which you know, uh, books to study. But hadith science is a complicated science. It's a deep science. I don't have the brain cells for it. But there are some people I know that do, alhamdulillah. So I need to take advantage of them. And I do this out of awe and out of appreciation of the people who, like, they've dedicated 40 years to studying just hadith. That's no small task. And they, they sit there, and then there are people who've, st who've maybe got a copy of, they don't even have a copy of it, they have a Google version of, like, the books of hadith, and now they're ready to own the sunnah of the Prophet And they compare themselves to these ulama. It's so silly. It's just silly. One of my teachers, you know, one time he said that he was teaching a hadith, and one of those students, it was like one of those Google students sitting in the class. He goes, uh, Sheikh, man qala hadha? who said this hadith? What's your dalil that this is sahih? So the Sheikh says, you know, narrated by so and so, son of so and so, by so and so, and so. You know what happens in the names? So he gives him like 20 names off the top of his head. And he goes, is that, is that okay? And the student says, yes. He goes, you idiot. I just named all the students in the class. <laughs> People want to feel like they're, no, oh, I, I got the authentic Dalil. You don't know what you're talking about. You don't know. It's so hard for people to accept what they don't know. It's so hard. I have, you know, may Allah not make me from those kinds of people. I have no problem accepting what I don't know. And I'd rather go ask someone who spent their life t studying this stuff. And I'd rather, t I'd, I'd much more seriously take their opinion and their research and ask them hard questions too 
then, then you know, just do Google searches myself. At least, especially when it comes to the Sunnah of the Prophet I think it's a sensitive subject. That's my own view. You don't have to take my view, but that's my own view. And my view of that has become more sensitive because of my study of the Quran. Because of its study. So may Allah Azza make us really loyal followers of the Sunnah of the Prophet And may Allah Azza make it easy for the beautiful Sunnah of the Prophet to become widespread. And the misuse of it to become a thing of the past. Barakallahu li wa lakum. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thanks for watching guys, I hope you benefited. I'd like to encourage you to actually embark on a comprehensive journey into the Quran. I've done a video translation and explanation of the entire Quran. It's called Quran Cover to Cover. I'd like you to check it on at Bayina TV, just do a little bit of it every day and before you know it, you'll have gone through the entire Quran and translation with me. Hope you can take part. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah.